when we talk about the Bible, uh, let, let's start by going to uh, the book of Leviticus. One of the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Actually, the third book of the Bible, Leviticus. You see the word Levi, and when we talk about Levi, what do we think of? The priest, right. They were the tribe that were assigned to be the priests or the pastors of Israel. And if we go to uh, Levi or Leviticus uh, chapter 19, this would be page 143 in the church Bibles, 143. Uh, you know, we talk about the Bible as a whole, all 66 books. And when I say 66 books, I'm talking about what we would call the Protestant Bible. Because the, the Pope has added several other books to his Bible for his church. Uh, but those are books that were never accepted by Jesus Christ in terms of the Old Testament. And uh, they were never accepted by the early Christian era church, the New Testament era, as being uh, definitely from apostles. But for some reason, they want to add these other books to their Bible. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, the, the Bible that Jesus accepted in terms of the Old Testament, 39 books, and the <clears throat> 27 books that we accept and have always been accepted uh, in the New Testament era, in the New Testament. 66 books total. Those are the books that uh, most Bibles have always had. Uh, as, we, as we mentioned last week, I would say in America anyway, most houses probably have a Bible in them. Would you agree? Okay. I know when uh, when we make evangelism calls door to door and we actually get into a conversation with people, we say, "Well, let's look at your Bible." Uh, most of them never say, "I don't have one." Most of them say, "Oh, uh, where is that? Where is that? Where?" Is that? <laughs> you know, they don't know where it is, but they they think they've got one. Now, maybe that's changed over the last several years, but that's the way it was. Uh, but as far as yeah, knowing what's in the Bible, what's between those two covers, uh, that's the key thing. And if you were to ask most people, well, what's the main message of the Bible, what do you think they'd say? When they think about the Bible, if they ever think about it at all, what do they think it's about, Daryl? Book of Love, huh? How to be good? They'd use the word God. It's about God. Okay, it's about okay. Yeah, way, way long time ago. It doesn't have any relevance today. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like uh, reading uh, one of the ancient uh, Roman or Greek writers. You know. Uh, and just doesn't have relevance today because uh, times have changed and all that. Uh, but I, I think, in my opinion, is when they think of the Bible, they think of, well, I don't want to read it. I don't want to open it up and study it because why? I'm kind of, well, not, I'm kind of afraid of it. Yeah, I think they think of it as, it's going to tell me I'm wrong. It's going to tell me I'm going to have to change. And I don't want to change. I want to run my life the way I want to run it. And I don't want God telling me different. If, you know, Kevin thinks that they think it's a book of, about God. In other words, they inherently feel guilty about it. Like, it's going to make me feel guilty. That God doesn't approve of me in some way, and he wants me to change in some way, and uh, I don't want to change. 
So it's kind of that bothers their conscience, I think. But they look upon it, yeah, love is, is a really a word of law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Which Jesus said is a summary of all ten commandments. And um, so I think most people, when they look at or when they think about what the Bible is and whether they should get into it or not, they look at it, let's put it this way, as a book of law. It would be like reading uh, the Constitution or reading uh, a book of, of Illinois statutes, you know, uh, a lawyer would be interested in it, maybe. What we're supposed to do. Well, is that in the Bible? Yes. Yeah. A lot of the Bible is law. Is God's law. Is, is God telling us how to live? Does he have a right to do that? Why does he have a right to tell us how to live? Yeah, because he created us. Not only did he create us, he sustains us. Uh, all of the things that pertain to our life have nothing to do with us. The sun coming up this morning, did anybody here cause it to come up? No? Uh, the fact that we have air to breathe and water to drink and, and so forth and so all the necessities of life, that's God's gift, just as life itself is a gift. Uh, he has the right, then, to tell us what to do, how to live in his creation. And the Bible says he will call us to account for whether we obeyed his law or not. He has the right to judge us. He has the right to punish us when we break his law. Uh, here in Leviticus, you have an example of that. Look at verse 1 and so forth in chapter 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, What? Ye shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. And he goes on to list some other laws. You can just kind of glance down there. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. Those, that's law. Yeah. Now, some of those laws only applied to the Old Testament Israel, but some of them apply to all people of all times. For example, thou shalt be holy, as he says in verse 2. That applies to all people of all time. What does holy mean? Sin free, yeah. In other words, always obeying God. God is holy, and you are holy if you always do what he says that you must do. Are we holy? No. Exactly. We are unholy. Uh, we are sinners. That's the same thing. Unholy, sinners, same thing. In other words, we have disobeyed God's law. Okay? The law in the Bible is where God tells us how to live, tells us what to do, what to think, what to say. Uh, and God will judge us on the basis of that law. And if we truly are sincerely reading this, we must admit We've broken God's law. Now, if you can't get over that, you'll never go to heaven. If you can't, if you, if you can't understand and believe what I just said, you're going to hell. You will be punished because you're a sinner, period. There's no hope for you. You could call this Sunday Prodigal Son Sunday. That's the theme of this Sunday. 
third Sunday after Trinity. And the prodigal son did what? Before that. He left. He said, Father, I wish you were dead. I don't want you running my life. I don't want you telling me what to do. I want to do what I want to do all the time. I'm leaving you. All I want you to do is give me something to live on. Yeah, which is like people. They say, God, I want you to make the sun come up in the morning. I want you to give me air to breathe and food to eat. I want you to give me all that stuff. I want you to keep me alive, but I don't want you to tell me what to do. I don't want to live in your household. I want to live under your control. I don't want to obey your law. That's the prodigal son. And so he left. He took his portion of the inheritance, which his father did give him. But he did what with it? Wasted it in sinful living until it was all gone. And he was reduced to the lowest form of life. He was feeding swine in a pig yard far from home. Kevin? Represents your life in this world. Yeah, it's it's God giving you earthly life and sustaining your earthly life. Yeah, He lets you live, even though you rebel against Him, even though you, you sin against His law. You wish he was dead and out of your life. He still mercifully says, well, I'm going to give you some life to think about this. I'm going to give you some years on earth. I'm not going to kill you right away. I'm going to give you some years on earth to repent of that. So basically in the parable, he asked for something that he already had? Well, again, it's a parable. It's it's not an actual story. Uh, The father isn't really a father. It's God Almighty. The, the prodigal son isn't really a son. It's everybody. It's me and you and everybody else, every human being has ever lived. And that, that's, it's showing us what we are by nature. We have life. God's given us life. He's given us that inheritance. But we've wasted it on sinful living. Now, if he had just continued in that sin... What would have happened to him? Yeah, he would have just died in that pig pen. But he did what? Yeah, and he said to himself, I will return to my father and tell him what? Before that. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. That makes the difference. You see, he didn't just say, I still hate my father. Uh, It's his fault I'm in this pig pen. Uh, It's all his fault. I hate him. I'm not going back to him. I'll die before I go back to him. But he didn't. He heard the law, or he felt the law, And he knew it was his fault. His fault, not God's fault. And maybe my father will take me back as a servant. I know I'm not worthy to be his son. I'm unworthy. It's my fault. So you've got to come to that first stage of hearing the law and saying, God, I I admit it, I have not kept your law. I've broken your law. I've gone my own way. I've done what was right in my eyes, not yours. I've lived my way, not yours. I haven't followed the Bible. I haven't listened to the Bible. I don't care about the Bible. I, I live the way people around me live. I live the way I can get get on in life down here the best. I lie, cheat, steal, whatever it takes to get along in life. And I get my morality from the people around me, not from your word. I admit that. And I admit it's wrong. Now, if you can't get to that stage, 
You're like the prodigal son who stayed in the pig pen forever and never went back home. But if you get over that stage and you get to the point where the prodigal son got, where he said, my God, I have sinned. I am an unholy person. I deserve God's wrath and punishment eternally. I, I wonder if God will take me back. I wonder if there's anything that can be done about that. Or am I just hopelessly lost? If you get to that point, like the prodigal son, and he says, I'll go back to my father and beg his mercy. Then what happens? Yeah. Yeah, then comes the other part of the Bible. What does God do? What does the Father do? He sees his son returning finally. While he's at a long way off, he runs to save him the embarrassment of walking through the village in his tatters. He runs to the village with his, you know, he, he takes the embarrassment for the son. And he sees to it that the son, when he walks to the village, will be dressed in the finest robe, finest clothing, with rings on his fingers and so forth. That's what God does for us. What does the prodigal son do? He doesn't even get a chance to... Say to God, I will be your servant. Before that, God has forgiven him. That's the other half of the Bible that most people have absolutely no concept of. All they see it is, is this. If I do this well enough, I'll go to heaven. If I don't do this well enough, I'll go to hell. They don't even know about this. The, Yeah, this is what God has done to save us. Totally aside from anything we have done. And what has he done? He has had mercy upon us. He has he loves us with an everlasting love. And he has come down from heaven and become a true human being, the man he calls Jesus. That was his God-given name, which means savior. He came to seek and to save us prodigal sons who were lost. He runs to meet us. He lives a holy life, a sinless life. He obeys the law of God perfectly his whole life in thought, word, and deed. Never once sins. God looks upon him and says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then he sends him to the cross to be crucified. Our death. He did it all. He paid for our sins. He died in our place for our breaking of the law. The Bible says, He became sin for us. He who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. That's the gospel. It has nothing to do with us. It has all to do with God. What God has done to give us the free gift of heaven. Those are the two parts of the Bible. That's it. Everything, every verse, every word of the Bible can be fit into one of those two categories. It's either what God commands us to do and not to do, and what God has done to save us because we have broken his law. What we read in Genesis 49, what we read in Revelation or in John or in Malachi or anywhere else in the Bible fits into one of those two categories. Now the problem is most people try to find salvation or heaven 
over here. Not here. You can't find heaven here. The only place you can find heaven is here. And what God has done to save us. Over here, you will not find heaven. You'll find punishment. God's justice and wrath upon your disobedience. Yes. That's right. You, that's why I say you can't even begin to get to first base with God until you get to that point where the law shows you your lost condition, that you cannot save yourself. If you look at the Bible, and say, well, for example, this passage in Leviticus, we just read, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You remember last Sunday in the sermon, I talked about the man who had the dream? He walked up to the wall of heaven and he saw a gate in the, in the, in the, you know, he died and he was standing at this gate of heaven and over the gate it said, thou shalt be holy or thou shalt not see God. That's law. But the guy thought he could go in. He tries to go in and somebody taps him on the shoulder and says, you can't go in there. And the guy says, why not? I'm holy. He says, oh, no. Don't you remember when we were little kids? You cheated me out of a marble. You stole that marble from me. That's a sin. You're not holy. You can't go in by that gate. You've got to come to that knowledge first. But most people don't. You ask most people, what is your hope for heaven based on? Do they give you a law answer or a gospel answer? Do they say... I have done this, I have done that, or they say, because God has done this and done that. Yeah, they point to themselves. Well, I have done this, I have believed that, I have tried to do this, I, 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 I. That's law. They try to justify themselves, saying, well, I've, I've kept the law good enough. I've been, I've been pretty good. Maybe not perfect, but I'm good enough. It's all law. They think they can get to heaven through the law. The only thing you can get to in, with the law is into hell because you've broken it. The Bible says, he that offends the law in one point is guilty of all. You might as well have sinned your whole life and done nothing but sin. Just by one sin, you're not holy. So we're all short of the glory of God. But the gospel, what God has done to save us, that gets us into heaven. So if you ask somebody, what's your hope for heaven based on? That you would tell them, Jesus. God has come down from heaven and died on a cross and paid for my sins and made me holy and I'm cleansed in his blood. That's why God should let me into heaven. And I know he will, he's promised to. You see, but you have to understand when you're reading the Bible which is law and which is gospel, and never look for your salvation in the law. Always look for it in the gospel. Let's look at another Bible verse. Let's go to the back of the Bible, 1 John. This will be on uh, page uh, 1328 in the church Bibles, 1328. And by the way, let me stress this while you're looking that up. This doesn't mean Old Testament and this New Testament. Both of these are in both Testaments. Okay? The law and the gospel are both in the Old Testament. The law and the gospel are both in the New Testament. For example, New Testament, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's all law. Let's put it this way. It's 99.9% law. The only part that's gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, which is three whole chapters, is the Lord's Prayer, where you say, forgive us our trespasses. The rest of it is you shall do this, you shall do that. 
the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus uh, explains the Ten Commandments, you know. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery. Whosoever hateth his uh, neighbor without a cause has committed murder. You know, that's all in the Sermon on the Mount. That's all law. It's all what we should do and what we should not do. There's no gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. So it's not a New Testament, Old Testament thing. Both are in both Testaments. Well, now here in 1 John, uh, the first epistle of John, not the Gospel of John. Everybody have that? On page 1328, uh, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Is that law or gospel? That's law. It doesn't say anything about what God's done to save us. It just tells us that, uh, that we have sinned. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's that? That's gospel. Ten, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. What's that? It's the law. Go on to the next verse. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. What's that? That's law, but look at the next verse, the next sentence. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What's that? Gospel. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means atonement or payment for our sins. Verse 2, what is that? Law or gospel? Gospel. It's what he has done to pay for our sins. So you you, you read this and you can say, well, I, I can easily see where somebody would misunderstand the Bible. Because... If they don't understand that I can't be saved by the law, they're going to see in these law passages, well, I've got to do that to be saved. And they wouldn't see their salvation in what Jesus has done to save us. <coughs> Let's go to another one here. Let's flip over to chapter 4. Look at verse 9. First John four nine. This is page thirteen thirty one. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we through Him, that we might live through Him. What is that? Law or gospel? That's gospel. It's what God has done to save us. Verse ten. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation. There's that word again. For our sins. What's that? It's gospel. 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. What's that? That's law. Very good. Yeah. Can we be saved by uh, verse 11? Nope. So don't look for your salvation there. Look for your salvation, verses 9 and 10. But your response to verses nine and ten, or, or uh, nine and ten, should be verse eleven. That's you know. Now that we know we are saved, we love the law and try to follow it, but we don't find our salvation in that. We always find it over here. Martin Luther said, "If you understand this." You should be a doctor of theology. You ought to have a doctorate degree. You understand the difference between law and gospel and how to apply them. Because you understand how the Bible's written and how is it to be read. Don't try to find your salvation in the law. And understand law when you're reading it. It tells you what to do, how you should live. Never find your salvation there. You only find it where it talks about what God has done to save you. 
Let's go back to the Old Testament again. Let's go back to Exodus, second book of the Bible. Exodus 34. And this will be page 108. 108 in the church Bibles. Exodus 34, verse 11. Exodus uh, 34, 11. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. God's speaking there, if you look at the context. What is that? Law or gospel? It's law. It tells you what to do. Observe what God commands. But then it goes on, Behold, I drive out before thee The Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. What's that? That's the gospel. He's promising the Israelites that when they attack the the Canaanite land, he's going to bless them and drive out those heathen before them and give them the blessing of uh, owning that land. Well, that's, that's an earthly blessing, but it's still God's doing by his grace and mercy. And it also leads to what down the road? It leads to the Savior, Jesus Christ, because that's, that's the land that he will come to many, many centuries later. So it's all part of God's plan of salvation. So right there in one verse, you have both law and gospel. But you have to see, you know, the difference. Let's go to another one. Let's go back to the New Testament. To the book of John this time. John, chapter 3. This is a little bit harder. Okay? You have to think a little harder on this one. Let's begin at verse 1 of, it's on page 1150 in our church Bibles. John 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. He didn't want to be seen with Jesus during the day because. Being a Pharisee, the Pharisees hated Jesus. And he didn't want to be in bad with his fellow Pharisees. But he was attracted to Jesus, so he came to Jesus by night and sent him, Rabbi, means teacher. We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Is that law or gospel? It, <laughs> well, that's what a lot of people would read there. But it's gospel. And Jesus is going to explain it later. Because if you go down and read further, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can I, how can I do this? This is impossible. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, I was saying, Except a man be born of what? Of water and the Spirit he cannot enter the kingdom. See, now he explains how you are born again. It's through the Spirit. Who's the Spirit? The Holy Ghost. You can't do this. In other words, you can't enter the kingdom of God by what you do. You can only enter into the kingdom of God by what the Spirit does, by what God does. So that's gospel. It sounds like law because it sounds like it's what you're doing. Oh, 
I must be born again, that means I must do this. And this is where the Baptists and all their offshoots go awry. Because that's the way they read this. They read this as law, not gospel. And they think they can find their salvation by what they do. I make a decision for Christ. I go up to baptism. I did that. And therefore, I can enter the kingdom of heaven now because I did that. I made myself to be born again. But Jesus makes it very clear in verse 5, no, it's not your doing. You're born again by water and the Spirit. That's gospel. It's what God does to save you. When you go to baptism, which is the water here, it's God the Holy Ghost working through that water to bring you to faith in Jesus. And that's called born again. Now I see the light. Now I see I cannot save myself. Now I see I'm saved only by the blood of Christ on the cross. Okay? But it's not my doing. It's the Spirit's doing. It's God the Holy Ghost doing it. So again, law gospel. You've got to know the difference. You'll never be saved by what you do, by the law. And um, he repeats that if you be going down to the uh, last sentence of verse 8. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Jesus goes on in that same chapter to have that very famous uh, passage, John 3.16. He says to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that law or gospel? It's all gospel. It's what God has done. And we now know that even that whosoever believeth in him, that's not law. That's not our doing. That's the Spirit's doing. We believe because of the Spirit. That's God's gift and doing in us that we do believe. And and for that, we shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the way to heaven. Not what we do, but by believing what God did. He sent his only begotten Son. Uh, Verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. How are we saved? By God sending his only begotten son. That's gospel, right? Verse 17. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. In other words, do you believe in what God has done for you? Or do you believe in what you have done for you? If you believe in what you have done, you're condemned already. If you believe in what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, then you are not condemned. In other words, the law doesn't condemn you. You're you're saved from the law. Verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. What's that, law or gospel? That's law except for the part light has come into the world. That light is Jesus. So, yeah, what God has done, he is light who's come into the world, but everything else is law. Man by nature rejects that. Okay? By nature, we love darkness rather than light. As the Bible says, the gospel is foolishness to us by nature. Only God can quicken us. Only God can bring us to new life by the Spirit. Uh, Let's go back to the Old Testament again. Uh, Deuteronomy this time, the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy 6. Uh, page 223 in the Church Bibles, 223. 
Deuteronomy 6. Let's look at verse 6. Deuteronomy 6, 6 begins, And these words... And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Is that law or gospel? That's law, yeah. Yeah. Telling you what you must do. Now, it's a good thing to do that. (laughs) Okay, the law is good. I'm not saying the law is bad. The law is good. Everything God commands us is for our good. What's bad about the law? Well, that's not. That's a good thing too. But what's? Yeah, the bad thing about the law is we've broken it. The law is good. But it's bad that we have broken it. So this is bad news. This is good news. And that's what gospel means, good news. This is bad news. Nothing good about it in regard to our salvation. It only shows us our condemnation. That's what's bad about it. But outside that, it's good. We should want to follow it. And when we come to faith in the gospel, we come to love the law and we say, it's good for us. I want to obey it. I don't want to commit adultery. I don't want to hate people. I I don't want to covet other people's stuff. I want to make God first in my life, have no other gods before him. I want to honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I mean, I want to do those things. I see where those things are great things to do. But I can't find my salvation because I haven't done them perfectly. I still only cling to the cross of Jesus Christ. There is my salvation. Okay? Let's go back to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Romans. Let's see, in the church Bibles, this would be page... uh, 1,223. 1, Romans 1, 16. Romans 1, 16. Begins, for I am not, of course the I is the Apostle Paul writing this, the human author. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is that, law or gospel? It's gospel because you can't believe in it yourself. It's not telling you to believe it because you have no power to believe it yourself. But when you read that and when you contemplate that, the Holy Ghost is coming to you and causing you to believe it. It even says the word gospel there. So that one's easy. And then it goes on in 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As is written, the just shall live by faith. Not by works. Not by what you do. But it's the righteousness of God. Okay? Righteousness of God. You are righteous by the gospel because God gives you his righteousness, not your righteousness. You have no righteousness. You have wrongness. You've done wrong. You've broken God's law, but you can still have righteousness. But it's not your righteousness. It's God's righteousness that he gives you. It's a given righteousness. It's his gift to you. So that on judgment day, when you stand before God, he will only see righteousness in you, but it won't be your righteousness. It'll be his righteousness upon you. Okay? But then you go on to 18. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Is that law or gospel? There's law. See, they're all intertwined. Sometimes both are in the same verse. You see how you have to read the Bible. You have to understand the difference between law and gospel. Never look for your salvation in the law. Always look for it in what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Now, this is such an important topic. When we talk about studying Genesis 49, he's talking, Jacob is being inspired by the Holy Ghost to to see the future for his children and their descendants. Is that law or gospel? Some of it's law. Because what? He talks about their sin. He talks about how they have broken God's law. But in some places, like with Judah, he says he's going to bring in Shiloh from him. And that's gospel. So even here, you have to know the difference. Every verse of the Bible, you have to be able to classify. Is this law or gospel? Is this God telling us what we should do and what we haven't done, and how he's angry with our sin and let's punish our sin? Or is this something God has done for us or will do for us to save us? And when you look at all these, he's promising that they will all have a place in Canaan. All of their descendants will have a, a territory in the promised land. Is that gospel or law? As I mentioned a moment ago. Yeah, it's, God, it's gospel because God's doing something for them for their salvation. God will give them that land. Now, sometimes they will as he prophesies with some of them, they will apostatize and go over to the ways of the heathen there, but that's law. What they will do is sin. But what he will do is give them this good land which will lead to the coming of Shiloh, their savior from sin, Jesus Christ. So everywhere in the Bible there's law and gospel. You have to know the difference. Or you will not... You will, you will wrongly apply law and gospel. You will say that somebody can be saved by the law, and that's wrong. You can never be saved by the law. All you'll see in the law is your sin. Shall we close with the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.